Good evening. You're all very welcome to the Royal Irish Academy to this, our second event as part of our Autumn Talk series under the National Archives Commemoration Programme. My name is Orla McBride and I'm the Director of the National Archives. The National Archives is the keeper of the state's memory in the form of its written records. All the records of the state are deposited in the National Archives. These records tell the story of the evolution of the state and relate to the social, cultural, economic and political history of Ireland from the Middle Ages through to the establishment of the Irish Free State in 1922 and into the modern era. Amongst its collections is probably the most important and famous document in Irish history, the Irish Treaty of 1921. Using the treaty as a centrepiece, we opened our Treaty 1921 Records from the Archives exhibition at the British Academy in London on the 11th of October, marking 100 years to the day that the Irish plenipotentiaries first entered Downing Street to begin negotiations on what would become the Anglo-Irish Treaty. The exhibition will open in Dublin Castle on the 6th of December, 100 years to the day that the treaty was signed in London. And that exhibition will be presented in partnership with the Royal Irish Academy and the National Library. As part of our overall commemorations programme, and to complement the exhibition, we are running a series of panel discussions and in-conversation events this autumn and winter. Following our panel discussion in September with Professor William Murphy and Professor Anne Dolan on Michael Collins and the negotiations chaired by journalist and broadcaster David McCullough, we are here this evening in the Royal Irish Academy with Michael Pertillo, journalist, broadcaster and former politician, and Dr Marie Coleman, Professor in Modern Irish History at Queen's University in Belfast, where they will explore and discuss the treaty negotiations, their impact, what was at stake for both delegations, and will consider the wider implications the treaty had, not only for Anglo-Irish relations, but also for Britain, its allies and the Empire. We're delighted to welcome both Michael and Marie here this evening. They are no strangers to each other, having worked together in documentaries The Hawks and Doves, The Crown and Ireland's War of Independence and Partition 1921. We've asked Marie and Michael to have a conversation with each other this evening. But before we take questions from you, the audience at home, and I want to welcome over 450 people from around the globe who are joining us this evening, I'd like to remind you all that our uh, online our online audience that there's no chat room facility. So please send through your questions. So I'm now going to hand over to Michael and Marie, um, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Orla. Well, Michael, as, as Orla said there in her introductory m remarks, m many people watching in the audience will be familiar with your, <coughs> your political career and also your broadcasting career from your railway journeys. But they might have been slightly more surprised to see you on Irish television presenting documentaries <coughs> about 1916 and the War of Independence. Could you just give us a bit of background as to what stimulated your interest in this period of Irish history leading to the production of those documentaries? Yes, first of all, may I say what an honour it is to be here, and thank you so much for the uh, invitation. Well, um, I was approached by a production company uh, working with RTE, and the idea was to have a, a programme at first about the um, Easter Rising, uh, which would go under the general title, The Enemy Files. So this was thought to be quite a daring idea. The, uh, the enemy in question was the British, and the files were cabinet papers, letters, military orders, diaries, things like that. Um, and a, a representative of the enemy was required. And uh, this needed to be perhaps someone who had a bit of experience of making documentaries, perhaps who was a, a member of the British establishment, uh, who had uh, experience of being in a British cabinet and so would understand the mentality of British ministers, uh, possibly uh, advantageously uh, might have been on the Northern Ireland Committee as, uh, of that cabinet between 95 and 97 when we opened negotiations under John Major's uh, prime ministership with uh, the IRA. Uh, but perhaps the principal qualification uh, to represent the British in the period that we're talking about would be my ignorance of Irish history. Uh, because one of the points I'm going to make this evening is that I think the British you know, have consistently approached these uh, Irish questions with um, uh, really spellbinding ignorance of Irish history. Uh, 
uh, and uh, during the course of their negotiations and, uh, and their mishaps, have tended not to learn very much along the way. So I, I hope the one thing that may have happened in my case is that I've learned a little bit along the way. Mm -hmm. I want to come back later to that point about uh, British understanding of this period of Irish history. But obviously we're here tonight because we're coming up to the centenary of the signing of the treaty and much of our discussion will focus on the events of October to December 21. But I think to understand what went on in those rooms in Downing Street and in London during those months, we need to take a step back. Particularly, I, I'd like you to give us a sense of what you feel the British position going into those negotiations was and the extent to which that was coloured or influenced by those events in Ireland going back to 1916. Yes, and just before I answer that, let me make a general point which is there is a historian sitting up here on the platform, and it isn't me, it is you. Uh, and so <laughs> uh, I, I will do my best to answer historical questions from the television programs that I've made, but it is very important that you put me right and that you give your point of view. But I would say we definitely need to go back to January 1910. Uh, and I was just reviewing the, um, the numbers in that uh, general election of January 1910. The, um, the Liberals got two seats more than the Conservatives, but were quite a long distance behind in the popular vote. I think they were about two and a half to three percentage points behind in the popular vote. And the Liberals had lost 113 seats and the Conservatives had gained 116 seats, something of that order. So, you know, to all intents and purposes, the Liberals had lost the election. Uh, particularly when you think of you, you know, the importance of the matters that were at stake. But of course, the, the Liberals continued to govern. Why? Because they made uh, a coalition with the Irish Parliamentary Party. And the, uh, the deal was that Home Rule would be introduced. Now, all of that, all of you know. But I think what we have to try and understand is the degree of indignation that the Conservative Party felt about this. Um, uh, firstly, you know, th they thought that in a way the Liberals were cheating even to remain in government. But to remain in government at the expense of introducing Home Rule was, from their point of view, absolutely outrageous. Why so? Well, partly because they didn't think the Liberals believed in Home Rule, that the Liberals had made no attempt to introduce Home Rule um, since they'd been elected at the end of 1905, I think. Um, so this was not the Gladstonian uh, Liberal Party at all. And so the Conservatives thought that here they were very cynically introducing Home Rule. Well, what's wrong with Home Rule? Well, from the Conservative point of view, this was to, to put in play, to put a question mark against the British Empire. Because if Ireland was going to be allowed to slip away, what was, wh where did you draw a line in the sand? Uh, how could you prevent India slipping away? Uh, indeed, you know, this was a, a fish that was rotting from the head. I mean, Ireland wasn't India, Ireland was there. Uh, part of the United Kingdom. So, so, the, so they were, the Conservatives were absolutely outraged. <clears throat> and um, this may explain, <clears throat> although I don't think it excuses, the Conservatives' behaviour in the next four years running up to the beginning of the uh, Great War, uh, when, uh, again, as everybody knows, uh, over the, over the uh, arming of the, uh, of the UVF in, in the north, uh, the Conservatives are pretty much in a treasonable position. They ally themselves with, with men who are arming themselves to defy the will of the Crown. They are conniving at the mutiny of the British Army. Uh, so it definitely goes back to there, that sense of uh, indignation. And carrying that <clears throat> a stage further, so, so something that becomes extraordinarily clear in that period <clears throat> is that uh, Northern Ireland it's not called Northern Ireland in those days, that Ulster is going to be a terrific problem. That Ulster, uh, I, I think um, Randolph Churchill all the way back in the 1880s says Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right. Um, so it is very, very clear that Ulster uh, cannot be uh, coerced. And then I think the next stage in all of this perhaps is the, uh, the fate of the, um, of the 36th uh, uh, division, uh, the Ulster Division uh, of the Battle of the Somme, 
They go in on the, July the 1st and they're withdrawn on July the 2nd with 5,000 casualties, including 2,000 dead. So any question that you know, Home Rule can be implemented without special arrangements for Ulster is sort of absolutely knocked on the head uh, by that. Then uh, one would have to also say, well, look, uh, here are men dying in droves uh, uh, at, at the Somme uh, in the same year that over in Dublin, men are taking up arms which have been supplied by Britain's enemy, Germany, in order to mount an insurrection while Britain is fighting a war. The previous year, 1915, Britain had come perilously close to losing the war. So, of course, the appreciation in London is that these are terribly treacherous people who are stabbing the empire in the back in the middle of the conflict. So all of these things uh, create a background. And then we need to recall that um, uh, Lloyd George and, um, and Churchill are liberals, but after 1918, the government, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the government is made up of, to a very large extent, conservative members of parliament. The cabinet is made up very largely of conservatives. Uh, a lot of these people are diehards. The people who float to the top of the discussions, like uh, Walter Long and Bona Law, are particularly diehards. But even Lloyd George and Churchill are, in many respects, diehards. And Lloyd George is certainly extremely anxious uh, not to put himself, not to um, wrong foot himself with the majority of his coalition. So I think these are the, I'm sorry this has been a slightly long answer, mm -hmm. but I think that is the deep background. Uh, and I, I think it's absolutely important to grasp how long this had been boiling up amongst the British political parties and how passionately they felt about it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you on a number of points there that you raised. And I think you make an important point there about the Liberal Party and the, their sudden newfound interest in home rule in 1910. And I think it's, it's entirely right. They were returned with a majority in 1905, which is 5-6, similar to what the British Labour Party got in 1997. <laughs> Thank and, you. Um, had they... <laughs> had they had been as committed to home rule uh, in principle as say Gladstone had been in the 1880s they had the majority they had uh, even the House of Lords would have had trouble standing against a majority of that size so I think that's a very important point to make that it was purely a quid pro quo um, on the other hand surely the there's an argument that the Conservatives Act uh, as um, venally in this period, I mean, the idea of a Conservative Party threatening to hold up the, vote, the uh, army budget over home rule, it's not something one would associate with the Conservative Party who would traditionally be seen as supporters of the military. And I think that last point about the 1918 election is very important because in an Irish context, we tend to think of the 1918 general election, the story is the big win for Sinn Féin in the South. I think arguably what, what you said there, the new makeup of the British government is much more significant when it comes to the period we want to get into a bit more nitty gritty of the, the actual Irish settlement. But before we leave this, this longer view, I just want to hone in on the rising itself there in particular. Um, the, th that sense, I suppose, from the British perspective of tr this, that this was treason, it's there in the, in the proclamation. They talk about the support from the gallant allies in Europe. Uh, there was certainly no hiding what was going on. How, um, just how important was the rising in that British attitude, in colouring the British attitude towards Ireland, even leading up to 1921? Well, p p perhaps two comments. Um, I mean, and this is, you know, very, very delicate ground. Um, but, you know, I have often expressed surprise that, you know, the British government allowed 16 to be executed after the rising, which we know had uh, a very significant effect on moderate opinion in Ireland. However, I mean, to try and be historical about this, you know, human life was pretty cheap at the time. I mean, as I say, you know, later that year, um, 2,000 Ulstermen died uh, in, in, in two days. Um, deserters were being shot by the British Army. So I, I, I don't know whether one can really expect the British government to have thought to itself, uh, well, you know, these executions are going to make all the difference. They thought these people were uh, clearly traitors and that the context uh, justified their execution. 
I mean, in a way, what's more surprising is that uh, somewhere along the line, Asquith thought that the executions were counterproductive. I think they were going ahead uh, from what from the documents I remember seeing without his direct knowledge that it was decisions that were made on the ground in Ireland. He was eventually rather horrified about it, uh, and he brought them to an end. It's, it's possibly one of the reasons why De Valera survives. Um, I, I heard that put to me the other day by, by De Valera's grandson, uh, that possibly the reason he survives is that his execution was delayed, and by the time that they would have got round to it, the British had changed their policy. So that's one, one thing. Um, more broadly, uh, the, the impression I get from all the documents is a feeling of absolute exasperation with Ireland. So not, not even particularly, you know, the idea of being stabbed in the back or anything like that, just exasperation. Um, that I, I came across a marvellous quote. Let me just see whether I can find it quickly. Marvellous quote from Churchill the other day. Uh, let's hope I can find it. Um, as the deluge, now this is, he says this in 1922, as the deluge of the Great War subsides and the waters fall short, we see the dreary steeples of Famana and Tyrone emerging once again. The integrity of their quarrel is one of the few institutions that has been unaltered in the cataclysm which has swept the world. Now, what is the feeling that underlies that? It is exasperation. I think that's a good point to bring us more to the focus of 1921 in particular because um, I get the sense from what you're saying there, by 1921 the British government was trying to be rid of Ireland once and for all and that probably overshadowed a lot of the negotiations. This is a chance to get this off our backs once and for all. So I suppose to, to get a sense then of the year 1921 itself and what brought us to the negotiating table in London in in 1921. The, could we say a bit maybe about the importance of, of why, why did we get there? Why after two and a half years of guerrilla warfare was there suddenly this cessation of hostilities in the summer of 1921 which paved the way for the negotiations there? What, what stand out to you as the key events in the lead up to the negotiations opening in London in October 1921? Just before I answer that, just to, just to make one very obvious point, which is that the, the British government is busy with other things. Until the end of 19, it's busy fighting a world war. Uh, and then it's busy with creating the world peace with Lloyd George in a dominant position. Lloyd George takes up residence in Paris. Uh, he's not in London for most of uh, 1919. And uh, cabinet ministers are shuttling over to Paris to get their instructions. So Lloyd George's mind is not on Ireland when the, uh, when the War of Independence be uh, begins. Um, I think the most important event, to come direct to your question, the most important event in 1921 is the opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament. Because for some time, I think, the idea has crystallised that if the British can do right by Ulster, they don't much care what happens to the rest of Ireland. Um, there's some finessing of that position. Um, Churchill, from the time that he espouses home rule in the pre-Great War period, uh, flirts with the idea of uh, all-round devolution, so that um, home rule in Ireland will be in the context of home rule for Scotland, home rule for Wales, I don't know whether home rule for England. He's toying with these ideas. And even in 1922, he's, he's saying to anyone who will listen, including Michael Collins, that he would still like to see uh, a united Ireland uh, with two parliaments, but nonetheless, you know, an Ireland that was all in the, um, all in, that, that, that would work together. <clears throat> um, but, with, with, but with that footnote, I think the British generally think that if they can do right by Ulster, they're prepared to go a long way um, with, uh, with uh, their enemies. It, I think the other important thing is that the British think that the Irish are going to settle on their terms. And why do they think that in particular? They think that in particular because they turn up. The fact that they turn up probably means they're going to settle. And there's a very um, 
telling message, I haven't got the date, uh, forgive me, which uh, Churchill sends to Michael Collins, uh, if you wish to come to a conference on the basis of the integrity of the empire, come. If not, not. Uh, so I think Churchill at least concludes that if they've turned up, it's because they're going to settle on British terms. I think one other thing to say is that although the British government, Churchill in particular, had continued to talk about the War of Independence as though it were um, a, a criminal matter to be dealt with by the police and by the courts with the army merely in uh, support, of course they knew in 1921 that to beat the IRA they would have to send tens of thousands of troops. And sorry, just one other factor. The opinion of the United States and the opinion of the Dominions, I think, weighed very heavily on the mind of the British government. And here, I think Churchill had made matters a lot worse because not only uh, during the War of Independence were there um, unauthorized reprisals by the Black and Tans and by the auxiliaries, there were authorized reprisals, personally authorized by Churchill. Uh, and it was these reprisals in particular which had poisoned the well of American public and political opinion, and, and, and therefore, to some extent, he'd shot himself in the foot, I think, because the pressure from uh, the United States uh, was felt very keenly by him, with his American mother, not least. Mm. You're not uh, going on to dodgy territory there as a former Conservative minister criticising Winston Churchill, are you? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Churchill is a very complex character, and... I, I think he, cert he certainly fits into the category, which I've mentioned already, of people who didn't understand Ireland and weren't particularly interested in learning about Ireland. Even though he had, of course, important family um, connections here. You mentioned his, his mother and, of course, her sister was married to, um, uh, to one of the Leslies. So there, wa there was that, uh, the two Jerome sisters, there was a connection there. And I certainly, I think you're right, though. I think his cousin, Shane Leslie, would have shared your view of Winston's lack of knowledge of Ireland during this period. Um, but I suppose now if we want to move it to, to we've taken the, the the long lens view and we're, we're narrowing down to 1921 and to explore a bit what exactly was discussed in this um, IR exit of 1921 where Ireland, a part thereof, was negotiating its exit from a union of which it had been part for some time. We can identify four main points of discussion. The most important one, obviously, was what was going to be the constitutional status of this new entity. Its geographical boundaries, which to an extent had been settled by legislation, but that all seemed to come back into the mix again, somewhat to the surprise of James Craig, I think. Um, there were obviously there were financial implications Ireland's departure from the Union would have, there, there were all sorts of things like even, even recent matters like how much <clears throat> Ireland would be responsible for paying war pensions and things like that from the recent war, of what the position of any civil servants who no longer wanted to serve the new state would be and if they retired. So there's a, a more, I suppose, mundane but nonetheless important financial aspect to it. But the one that interests me, um, and, and this is where I want to draw on your own personal political experience is the issue of uh, the UK's uh, governments and the British government's concern for its own territorial security uh, because of course one of the one of the points one of the sticking points of the treaty was the fact that the British retained <coughs> a presence in three treaty ports on the island of Ireland, something which they retained until 1938. And of course, de Valera's n negotiation of the return of those treaty ports was an important precursor <coughs> to ERA being able to declare its neutrality during the, uh, during the Second World War. But if we go back to the rationale for the British government demanding that presence, <coughs> one of the uh, negotiating team in London in 1921 on the British side was the Secretary of State for War, Sir Lamming Worthington Evans. Mm. Now, uh, 70 years later, you have uh, probably the, the modern day equivalent of that role as Secretary of State for Defence. So, if you could kind of put yourself, have, having been Secretary of State for Defence, if you could put yourself in a role similar to that 70 years previously, how would a, a Secretary of State for War or Defence? <coughs> What concerns might they have had about an integral part of the union leaving and how that might affect 
British security. In the context, again, of just having fought a major international war, there were centuries of Ireland being uh, a threat to being the back door to invading the United Kingdom. We still have Martello Towers on the east coast of Ireland from the time of the Napoleonic Wars. 1798 was another example of it. It would continue again into the Second World War. So uh, can you tell us a bit about what your view is of, of why the British wanted to retain that defence and security presence? I, <clears throat> I think in the question you've largely um, answered the question, but um, if you're, if you're in the Ministry of War, as it was in those days, the Ministry of Defence in my day, I suppose typically you're fighting the last war again, which, by the way, w was, as it turned out, not a bad thing to be doing because the next enemy was going to be the same as the last one, and uh, submarine warfare was going to be important. And I, I, I have not found much that was contemporary, but in 1938, Churchill said the following to the House of Commons, when the Irish Treaty was being shaped in 1922, I was instructed by the Cabinet to prepare that part of the agreement which dealt with strategic reservations. I negotiated with Mr Michael Collins and I was advised by Admiral Beatty. The Admiralty of those days assured me that without the use of these ports, it would be very difficult, perhaps almost impossible, to feed this island in time of war. And then he goes into um, just how the ports operate and the flotillas that, uh, uh, that would deploy from there, and that if he doesn't have the Irish ports, how much further those flotillas have to uh, deploy. So the two thoughts are where you have to launch from to counter U-boats, and in general, how far the cargoes are having to travel across the Atlantic. Oh, and there, sorry, there are two aspects to that. One is uh, food that is going to feed Britain, uh, and the other one is that Britain lives by trade. So it's not just the food, it's also that we need to send our goods abroad because otherwise uh, we, can't, uh, we can't pay our way in the, uh, in the world. Now, Churchill in 1938 says the following, and I don't know whether he's being truthful about this, but it's interesting. In 1922, the Irish delegates made no difficulty about this. They saw that it was vital to our safety that we should be able to use these ports, and therefore the matter passed into the structure of the treaty without any serious controversy. And just one point of detail is that there were not three treaty ports in the treaty, there were four, because the one that is in Northern Ireland was in the treaty, because officially speaking, it was open to Northern Ireland to withdraw from, um, from the Irish Free State or not, as it wished, and therefore all four ports were in the treaty. And, and of course, that's quite an important point that Britain doesn't end up with no ports in Ireland. It, it keeps a port in Ireland. But of course, crucially, it doesn't have a port in South East Ireland. Mm -hmm. no, I think, and, and I think maybe some of the concerns about the need to retain those ports by the time the Second World War came along, the use of Luxwell, of, of the ports in Northern Ireland meant that uh, they still had that presence. So as you say, in, in, I think by, I know there's some discussion about why, uh, how wise it was of Chamberlain to return the ports in 38, certainly with, whether it was obvious at the time, but with hindsight, I think the view would be that they didn't make a whole lot of difference in the long run because with Northern Ireland, the Britain still had a defence presence on uh, in Ireland. But we're in danger of getting, uh, in, uh, getting ahead of ourselves here, I want to kind of focus ourselves back to, um, to 1921. Um, obviously, the most important of those four issues, which I, I mentioned there, which were the, the, uh, at, up for debate during the treaty negotiations, the most significant was what would be the constitutional status of this new Irish, uh, Southern Irish entity. Um, as you mentioned, in some ways, the British government had uh, decided to solve the, this long-standing Irish question by dividing it into two. And having solved the Ulster part of it, it was much easier for them to, um, to deal with Southern Ireland. And I recall on a visit to the Lloyd George Museum in Wales a number of years ago, among many of the great man's great achievements were the fact that he solved the Irish question, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I think the Irish might have a slightly different view of it than the, uh, than the Welsh might on that one. But you, you also said, uh, in, in answer to one of my previous questions, that they didn't really care too much then what happened with Southern Ireland. But 
surely they did care because they didn't give the Southern Irish what they wanted. They did not give them a republic. What difference did it make? Why did they not give, concede the republic? They had solved Ulster. James Craig was sitting in his parliament. He, was, uh, he had what he wanted. The Ulster issue, there was no issue of, con of coercing Ulster. So why did the British demand that there would still be that link between the United Kingdom and Southern Ireland? Why not just let them go their own way and save us all in Southern Ireland a year of civil war? Well, s s several ways of answering that, but some of them will be um, speculative. Um, first of all, I think it was, from their point of view, unimaginable to create a republic. Um, they had got their, their, they'd worked their way around from home rule to something that was beyond home rule, but inconceivable to them that it should be outside the British Empire, that there shouldn't be an oath of loyalty to the king. Um, I think mainly uh, they were worried about reducing the status of the monarch, but I think mainly probably the point we made before that they were still worried about how you drew a line in the sand for the, um, for the British Empire, how you stopped India going if um, Ireland had gone. So I think that's one sort of reason. I think the other reason is that they thought the Irish would agree to it. Uh, and I go back to my point that, you know, if Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith turned up and they knew what the British condition was, then that implied that they were going to, um, they were going to accept. It, it clearly, um, they clearly felt that the precedent of dominions within the empire was a, very, was a very strong protection. So they could argue, you know, what's happened to Ireland is, you know, not an unnatural thing at all, not all that surprising, because we've had dominions in the, uh, in the empire now for um, some time. And again, you'll probably be familiar with this phrase. Let me just see whether I can find this. Um, Ah, oh, here we are. I mean, can, can you believe this? It is not, this is, sorry, this is Churchill on the 21st of December 1921, reflecting on the treaty. Uh, no doubt England, he says, is conceding more to Ireland in this treaty than she has as a nation ever been willing to concede before. And no doubt she's done it, not only with a view to the future, but with a sincere desire to end a period of brutal and melancholy violence. It is not as a humiliation that this event is viewed by the world or by the empire. It is as a great and peculiar manifestation of British genius at which the friends of England all over the world have rejoiced. Every foe of England has been dumbfounded. So there's this idea that this rabbit that has been pulled from the hat is, is an example of, of British genius, that this, this, this halfway house uh, is, is a huge success. Mm -hmm. And of course, you mentioned the dominions there, and I think that's, um, that's quite important because we're not, Ireland, while it gets the same status as Canada, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, it's not the same as them because it is part of the Union. They were never part of the Union. So to concede a republic to Ireland, what might that have, what would the dominions have thought there were large Irish uh, populations in Australia, for example, where they, uh, during the First World War, mobilised quite strongly in opposition to conscription. They mm. did the same in Canada with less success. Uh, Smuts in South Africa post uh, the Boer War was trying to balance Anglo populations and Boer populations and head off similar demands. So I suppose they had to bear in mind what the Dominions would think if an integral part of the Union was given complete independence, the impact that would have on, um, on the Dominions. I, I'm interested by a couple of points you made about the, um, about the whole context of the talks. And I kind of want to narrow in on this because you spoke as well about your own experience in, in similar <coughs> talks, uh, I, I suppose talks of a similar nature over Northern Ireland in the 1990s. And the, this was played on Lloyd George's home ground. 
they were, as you said, they turned up. But not only did they turn up, they turned up in Downing Street. To what extent did Lloyd George have a very significant home field advantage in these negotiations, do you think? Um, I, th I, th I think he did have a home field advantage. Uh, he also had the advantage. Uh, he had been in office continuously since 1905. He had been Prime Minister for uh, five years. He'd been a leading figure in the government, what, since at least 1908. Um, so he had extraordinary political experience. And although one just has to take people's words for this, you know, he was, he was a Welsh wizard. He was a mesmerising figure. It seemed that, you know, people were swayed by him. And it does appear that he deployed his political gifts um, very ably. And by the way, the, the political gifts were not merely being charming when he wanted to be. They were also being very threatening when he wanted to be. So I think, you know, people probably know that there, there, there comes a point when Lloyd George says, you're either going to sign this thing or in three days' time we're going to commit ourselves. I can't, can't remember the, what the expression is, but something like terrible and unremitting war, some, some such expression. Um, so I think he did conduct it very well. And I have a feeling you might ask me this anyway, but you know, Collins says of himself that he's the wrong man to be there. Collins says of himself, I am a soldier. Uh, I'm not the person who's meant to be doing the negotiation. We know perfectly well who he thought should be doing the negotiation, uh, De Valera. Um, so Collins felt ill-equipped Ill to be there, and Lloyd George and Churchill very much felt they, they were on, well, both on home ground, but also on, on territory that they understood very well. Yes, and I think you reminded us of an important lesson for uh, those of us who study Irish history earlier on, that we are not the be-all and end-all of civilization. We are not the, the most important thing on the British government's uh, agenda at that time. When you spoke about Lloyd George having spent so much of the War of Independence period in Paris at the uh, the negotiations. So they were up against someone, uh, against one of the, mo the world's leading international statesmen who had just who was just fresh from conducting the negotiations to end the, for the treaties to end the First World War. So you have a very heavy hitting British delegation. By contrast, the, uh, the elephant in the room is the absence of de Valera. Um, so maybe we just take that point first. Uh, again, if, if you were to sort of uh, put yourself back maybe in your predecessor Worthington Evans's shoes in the 1920s, do you think you would have been surprised that the Irish went without, uh, that they arrived at Down, Downing Street without who, the person who was seen internationally as their leading, the leading political voice of the Irish independence movement? I, I think I might have thought that the Irish were disunited and uncertain about what they would settle for. And I think this is another terrific strength of the British. I think the British understood exactly what they were prepared to settle for. The Irish didn't know what they were prepared to settle for, and different Irish people thought different things. So the Irish didn't know what they'd settled for, and they were divided about what they would settle for. So I think this was another crucial advantage in the British position. I mean, the British set out, I, I think Lloyd George set out in 1919, more or less, what came to pass in 1921. But certainly at the beginning of the negotiations, the British set out their position and not much changes between then and the signature. Um, so the British might not have known whether they'd sign or not, although as I said before, the fact they turned up implied that they uh, probably would. And, uh, and that's obviously where Lloyd George saw his opportunity. Uh, he was a, a dis divided and uncertain Irish delegation so, all right, let's threaten them with going back to war. I don't know how much the, um, the British knew about the IRA's strength, or rather its weakness. Whilst on the one hand, it's perfectly true to say that the British thought they had to employ, they had to deploy tens of thousands of troops to beat the IRA. I think Michael Collins thought the IRA was in a very weak position. They had very few guns, and they had very few bullets for their guns. Now, I, do, I simply do not know uh, how much the British understood about how weak Collins thought his own position was militarily. I think that's a, an important point to raise, and I think in some ways possibly it... Um 
it disputes Collins's own view of him being an inappropriate person to be on the delegation. Maybe he was the right person to be there because it raises the alternative. And we're going to get a bit speculative here. You spoke about Lloyd George and the war and war within three days and immediate and terrible war. What might have been the alternative if the Irish delegation had not signed I, I, we're, we're going into very speculative territory here. I don't know the answer to it. Being a historian, we, we, the, the counterfactuals are, are interesting to think about. But have you any thoughts on what might have happened from a political perspective, having been involved in political negotiations where I'm sure things didn't work and you had to go back to the drawing table? Have you any sense of what might have happened if there hadn't been a, sign, a signature on the 6th of December? I think you lead me to a speculation uh, too far. I think what I would say is I think Lloyd George's threat was probably an empty one, but the, but the bluff was accepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think you, what you're basically saying that Lloyd George successfully called the bluff of the Irish delegation. Um, a point which, you, which has come up, I think, throughout our discussion, even as far back as, as speaking about the run-up to the negotiations, has been the whole issue of seeing these events in the wider international context. We've spoken about them in the context of the <coughs> empire and the Commonwealth, but you touched a few times on international opinion in your uh, discussion of, of maybe some of Churchill's uh, faux pas during the War of Independence. How important was it, do you think, to the British government? How significant a factor in their thinking was wider international opinion? And wh what parts of the world, apart from the empire, what other bits of international opinion were they hoping would, would be satisfied by what came out of the Irish negotiations? Well, I think the United States was extraordinarily important to them because it had been their recent ally, and of course, because Britain's economy was in a terrible mess, and because uh, American help might be needed both economically and militarily, uh, and because such terrible things had happened in the War of Independence to blacken Britain's name, and because all of this seemed disproportionate, because as we've said a number of times, there were bigger fish to fry. So to allow your your relationship with the United States to wash up on the question of Ireland when, there were, you, know, when you were busy redrawing the world map. So I think, I think American opinion must have been very important. I mean, one thing that keeps striking me is you've, you've made the connection, I've made it myself, between <clears throat> these negotiations and the ones that happened uh, in the period uh, leading up to 1998, the Good Friday Agreement. <laughs> one thing that's very striking is this was all done in two and a half years. I mean, the, the, the War of Independence, which is in some ways quite similar to the Troubles, lasts two and a half years. The Troubles with which I was associated uh, lasted for 30 years. years. 30 years. And so, I mean, in a way, what's striking is how quickly the British government move um, and how far they move. I mean, I can see that, you know, from the Irish point of view, the fact they don't concede a republic uh, they're, not, they're not moving all that far. But my goodness, it's a, it's a big movement um, considering where they were, and particularly because now you've got a majority conservative government. So the people who were absolutely against home rule before 1914 are now conceding home rule plus plus uh, in 1921. So the British have moved a long way. And I think that is some sort of testimony to the degree to which they felt the pressure. Mm -hmm. A point you raised there uh, in passing in answer to one of my questions, but I wanted to pick it up again, and that's the, uh, the role of the monarch. Because the, we, we've mentioned the king maybe once or twice in passing, but when it came to the reception which the treaty got in Ireland, when it was brought back and debated, a sticking point for Republicans was the oath. The oath, to give it its correct title, the oath of fealty to the constitution of the Irish Free State and the oath of, uh, the oath of allegiance uh, and the oath of fealty to the king. Um, I got those the wrong way around, so I'll get them right. Uh, but the most important thing was that for Irish Republicans to sit in the Parliament, they were going to have to take some oath which would recognise the King was still the head of state. And that goes back to my question of what, why did the British insist on that? I mean, why could you kind of give an Irish audience looking in hmm. tonight some sense of why the monarchy was so important and why the, the 
king's name had to be kept in there when it was obviously so controversial in Ireland after when the treaty was brought home? Well, I haven't seen, I haven't seen documents on this, so this really would be uh, a speculation. But I think if we enter into the thought of the time, I hope we've sort of established in the audience's mind that you know, the empire was the question that kept coming up, the relevance of Ireland to the empire, not just to the United Kingdom, but to the empire. Well, you know, everywhere in the empire, the, uh, the emperor king was the monarch. Um, extraordinarily important in India that the emperor king was the monarch, but he, uh, the, emperor, uh, the, the king was the monarch in Canada, in Australia, by the way, still is. I mean, that's would say the, uh, the, queen. the queen is the head of state in those places, still is after all this time. So I think, I, I made this point before that it was beyond their imagination. I think in 1921, it was beyond their imagination that Ireland would not take an oath of loyalty to the crown. Um, th there's another, I won't bother looking it up, but there's, th there's another quote where um, Churchill says, and it goes to the negotiating stance, he says, on the one hand, I wanted to make clear to the Irish that they were getting everything that Gladstone had offered in home rule, plus much more. And on the other hand, I wanted them to understand that we were not afraid of, again, some phrase like unrelenting war. So, you know, the British thought they'd gone a long way, but not to have, not to have an oath to the king. That was beyond what they could conceive, I think. And again, I mean, it depends how you judge these things, but the Irish delegation agreed to that. Uh, the Irish cabinet agreed to that. Uh, the Doyle Aaron agreed to that. And in the end, the civil war was won by those who agreed with that. So you might say the British got their negotiating position right. Mm -hmm. I think Collins's hope had been that he could, re he could write the Irish constitution, the 22 Irish Free State Constitution, in such a way as to dilute a lot of the significance of that. But the British government saw through that and uh, didn't, didn't allow him his way on that one. One point which was we raised, I actually, I think you raised it at the start, and I said I wanted to come back to it, and I want to do that towards the end of our discussion, is that we have spoken about this very much in an Irish context, and Orla, uh, at the director of the National Archives, in her opening remarks there, spoke about how the treaty is one of the most important documents in modern Irish history. But we, what we are talking about here is Anglo-Irish relations, and there's two parts to that relationship. There's the Irish, but there's the, also the Anglo side of it. And this is an important part of modern British history. This, the, the modern British state, the name of it on the, that nice new blue par passport is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That has a change from the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland of 1801. So the current name of the British state dates from this period. The geographical boundaries of the state date from this period. The United Kingdom lost something like a quarter of its land mass, and if you, judging by the 1911 census, I think 7% of its population. Is it recognised in Britain, do you think it was recognised then, or particularly do you think it's recognised now, how important these events relating to Ireland were in that wider British context, and how much is known about it in Britain today, do you think? You've made a point in passing which helps to answer some of our previous questions because you, you said that uh, you know, the land mass is reduced by 7%. But of course, the land mass of the British Empire is not reduced by any percentage at all. So you know, that's another reason why it's got to be dominion status, oath to the king. Because you can say, oh, the, one, oh, yeah, well, the United Kingdom has changed shape, but the British Empire is uh, as it was before. Um, I'm afraid, I think there's, um, there continues to be very little understanding of, um, of Irish history, despite the fact that, uh, you know, uh, particularly during the Troubles, it was, you know, what, what happened in Ireland was so important to all of us. And I was thinking about this. I think Ireland's relationship with Britain is a bit like Britain's relationship with the United States, in that we think we know an awful lot about the United States, we British. And it pains us when we get over there and we find that the United States knows nothing about us. So we know all, we know all their television programs. You know, broadly speaking, we kind of follow their politics. We kind of know where the states are and so on. We recognize figures from American television, chat show hosts, and so on and so on and so on. 
And then it, it's really quite painful when we find the Americans know nothing about us at all, not even the basics, you know, like England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, nothing. And I think it's a bit like that. I mean, whenever I come here, quite honestly, I'm humbled, uh, you know, that people come up and talk to me about British politics and know more about British politics than I do. And I cannot reciprocate. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, these, this, it's painful to say all this, but that's the way it is. And, and I've been very struck recently. I, I was filming here last week with a, with a film crew. And how long have we been talking about the Northern Ireland Protocol and all of that? When I came over with my crew, we flew to Belfast. They were dismayed that they were filling in um, you know, Irish health protocols to go to Belfast. How can this be, they said. How can, I said, have you not been reading the newspapers? And when we crossed the border into the Republic, they said, we don't have to show our health papers. How can this be? And I said, have you not been reading what's in the newspapers? So even you know, what's happening today, they haven't taken in. Just to, uh, before we go to questions from our audience and from our virtual audience as well, when you, you talk about uh, what's happening today, um, are there, do you think it would be fair to suggest that there, is a, there are possibly some useful lessons to be taken from the Anglo-Irish Treaty negotiations of 100 years ago in the event of Scotland finding itself in the same position as Ireland down the line? Would you recommend uh, any British government at the time take out their textbooks and look at the Irish example? Uh, the, I mean, the contexts are the contexts are very different, you know, because great violence was involved in the first case, and thank goodness, great violence is not in, involved in the case of Scotland. I suppose one of the things you said at the beginning struck me which is that the, the treaty that you know, we think we understand a bit, it had all those paragraphs about money and about pensions and about bases. I mean, we would now call them bases. They were called treaty ports in those days. But you know, the same thing's gonna come up with Scotland if it happens, Fast Lane and so on. So I think what strikes me is the hideous complexity of the divorce. Uh, and you know, maybe that's a point that um, unionists would, would wish to deploy during the next referendum campaign, wh wh whenever it is. You know, you may think it's easy, but it is not. And, and of course, in that context, the four years of negotiating Brexit um, might lead some people in Scotland to think that it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated and it's unpredictable. Okay, well, I think uh, that it, that's most of the questions we had uh, wanted to explore and tease out in our discussion. And uh, we've raised so many, and I think any one of them we could have spoken for the whole time. So I'm sure that has ignited some uh, thoughts among our, our in-person audience who's here today and also our virtual online audience. So I, I invite any questions now from the, the audience. So for Morris Manning, first of all. Thanks. First of all, that was really wonderful conversation. The time flew by. You covered so much ground, most entertaining and informative. Uh, two quick points. One issue you didn't touch on was the change in British public opinion in the period leading up. And to me, and when you read the the pro-Tory newspapers, well, the Times in particular, there is a definite change of tack even in the months, weeks coming up to the treaty, where the sort of impatience and the need to get a settlement uh, it becomes very obvious. You also, Michael, you raised the lack of imagination. And I think this became very obvious after the treaty was signed, say when Collins, as I think Mary mentioned, was trying to take the sting out of some aspects of the settlement in the constitution. And the constitution which emerged was one of the finest constitutions of its time with its human rights provisions. And it was very far ahead of its time. But where he wanted to soften things, he always got a very strong no from the British civil servants. And maybe that was one lost opportunity. I I think those are excellent points, um, almost more than being questions. You, you're absolutely right that uh, the British government was concerned about British public opinion, and British public opinion was moving towards wanting a settlement. And, as so often happens, I think also the newspapers were influenced by the politicians. So, the, you know, the politicians had decided they wanted a settlement, 
and, and the newspapers, I think, to some extent, uh, tended to reflect that too. Um, on your second point, I've, I've been talking about the clarity of the, of the British position, but perhaps now to argue against myself a little bit. Um, I mentioned before that Churchill still hankered after some sort of all-island deal. Um, I don't know whether I'll find this one. There's a, there's a point where, while the negotiations are still going on, he says to Collins, I, I wish to keep the ground clear in hopes of a general return at the right moment to the governing idea of the Collins-Craig Pact. I think you should turn over in your mind what would be the greatest offer the South could make for Northern cooperation. And so in, in a way that was not, I think, particularly well defined, it seems that Churchill at least was still hankering after uh, not uh, Northern Ireland left the Irish Free State, so that was clearly going to happen. But in some way, he still wanted there to be an all-Ireland settlement. So the idea of the Irish going back from the treaty and then, and then moving themselves further away again, I think went against also that British idea, I think a rather romantic idea, that some sort of all-Ireland arrangement would continue to exist. Uh, I think Michael Kennedy I wanted to come in there next. Yes, thank you very much. I agree with, with Morris there. I thoroughly enjoyed that, Michael. It was a, it was a really, really fascinating uh, conversation. You, you talked about negotiating from strength, and you talked about the home advantage that Lloyd George has, and you, you uh, talked about his tactics. Um, were you to give advice to the Irish delegation, they're negotiating from a weakness, what advice would you give them on the manner of negotiating with a British uh, government team? Um, it, it, it just feels to me a little bit as though the Irish were more aware of their weaknesses than their strengths. Um, there was absolutely no way that the British wanted to commit thousands of troops to Ireland. And I'm not sure there was any way that it could have committed thousands of troops to Ireland. And that was the alternative. So I'm not sure that the Irish delegation saw how difficult that was. I assume the Irish delegation knew how great was the pressure from the United States and from the Dominions. I assume they were pretty well uh, informed on that. Um, given how poor British intelligence was in this period, I rather doubt whether they knew, whether the British knew how weak the IRA was, militarily speaking. In fact, the speculation that Churchill didn't even know who Collins was. He thought he was the Minister of Finance, which he was, of course, but he didn't know he was the IRA chief. Uh, I, 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 I've read that. Um, so British intelligence was not very good. So again, the Irish might have perhaps uh, bluffed the British about how, how strong they were and how long they could continue the fight. There's, there's, a, there's another parallel here. I've often wondered you know, why the IRA came to the negotiating table uh, in, the, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, and I think one of the reasons was they were so penetrated by British intelligence. I think that was absolutely a key factor. So many, there were so many informants. Uh, I, think we, I think we now know as a public record that Jerry Adams's driver uh, was was passing information. So, um, th it, in that context, the British knew what was going on. I think in in 1920 21 they probably did not. So I think possibly the Irish underestimated uh, their position, and possibly, but you see, I think Collins probably was right that he was the wrong man, and maybe De Valera could have played a, a, a better hand. But then maybe De Valera was, I mean, I assume De Valera was not interested in making this agreement. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, <clears throat> it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. You bring a very particular perspective uh, to these uh, extraordinary times. Uh, particularly as the successor of Churchill in the Department or the Ministry of Defence uh, a few years afterwards. It's really fascinating. But also, 
bearing in mind your knowledge of pol British politics, particularly of the time, I have I wonder what your view is in respect to what how the delegation actually did. Did the Irish delegation get everything that was really going? And a nuance on that, did Lloyd George get them everything that was really going at the time? I'm not sure I can answer that because I'm not sure I can think of you know, how thinly you might have sliced the cake. Uh, uh, Marie and I have discussed you know, the, the strongest headlines. So dominion status, yes. Republic, no. Uh, oath to crown, essential. I don't think you could have sliced those things any more thinly. Uh, and the British still agree for all the reasons we've given during the discussion. I mean, whether the British would have had a different position after two more years of war, uh, I don't know. I think what I'm saying is that I think the Irish got what the British were prepared to offer. But that was partly because the British knew at the beginning what they were prepared to offer and the Irish didn't quite know what they were ready to accept. Did we have any more questions? Yes. Um, just one from Patrick there at the... Uh, well, just to echo what people have said about how wonderful uh, this evening has been and beautifully chaired by Marie and uh, a wonderful discussion with Michael. But I, I'd like to ask a question about, uh, given that we have mentioned present-day politics, what does seem remarkable about the events back then is that things do seem to have been negotiated in good faith. And you didn't have examples afterwards of people saying, oh, well, of course, we never intended to keep that. Or perhaps maybe I might have a twist in that for Marie. Were there elements perhaps where there was that when it came to Northern Ireland that perhaps they thought they could uh, collapse Northern Ireland or where perhaps in terms of the Boundary Commission, did they believe that perhaps things could be reworked? Could I, could I, because I'm very intrigued by this, um, and I wanted to add it as a question to Marie, but one of the things that intrigues me is that the boundary, you said before that the, you know, the, the territory was understood, but the Boundary Commission is established under the treaty, I think, and at that point, people don't know what the Boundary Commission is going to produce. And then what strikes me is that a trick the Irish miss is that they don't put enough effort into the boundary commission. That's my, that's my impression. It's slightly beyond uh, this period. So actually, I think many people would argue that the results of the boundary commission are an abrogation of good faith. And of course, Michael Collins intends, by every means possible, but possibly over a long period of time, to weaken the treaty. Uh, and and you know, he's very clear about that with, you know, when he's talking to De Valera, he says, let's, let's accept this, and then we can weaken it over time, which is precisely De Valera's policy over the following uh, 16 years, a very effective policy. It works beautifully. So in that respect, you know, the Irish, I think, did intend to weaken the treaty. So you, I don't know whether you call that good faith or bad faith. It's, it's very interesting that um, certainly that quote before about the treaty ports, uh, Churchill is in no doubt whatsoever um, sorry, can't, can't find it, but, but what, what he says is that De Valera has absolutely shown bad faith in, ter in tearing up the, uh, the treaty on the treaty port. Well, sorry, he doesn't tear it up. He, he renegotiates it with the British. But he says that De Valera has shown bad faith. I'm glad, Patrick, you raised the issue of uh, Northern Ireland because the one uh, thing missing from much of our discussion was the position of Ulster, but I think that reflects the fact that it was not a major issue for the Irish delegation going into it. The sense you get was that Ulster, the question of Ulster was going to be the convenient get-out clause, the convenient issue on which to drag down the negotiations if they weren't going the right way. Um, it, it really, it, I think if there was any, if anyone thought there was bad faith involved in the negotiations, I think it would have been James Craig sitting in Belfast who thought the legislation in December 1920, which came into effect in May of 1921, was the last word. His parliament was up and running from June. And then suddenly he's faced with the possibility that this might be all 
completely renegotiated again in the treaty. So I think maybe if there's a view of bad faith, it is, it is James Craig wondering what Lloyd George is up to and underpinning, I think, the uh, sense that the, the creation of Northern Ireland comes around largely from unionist distrust of the British government. So I, I'm glad you've raised the, uh, the northern issue there. We've a number, uh, uh, quite a number of questions coming in now from our virtual audience. Um, and Michael, m many of them are for you. Um, some, uh, many related to your, uh, both your interest in the period, but some also to your own personal experience. <coughs> and one of our, uh, our audience has said that they recently came across your excellent documentary about your father's experience during the Spanish Civil War and just wondering if your knowledge of, of that period, uh, the Spanish Civil War, and uh, sort of interest in that has in any way um, influenced your approach to Irish history? Or... Well, that, that's a good question. I'm not, sh I'm not sure it had ever struck me before. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that the next program we make for RTE will, will be about the Irish Civil War. So uh, I should be walking even more on eggshells than I've ever done before, uh, because, of course, it will continue to be under the auspices of the enemy files. So it will be about the ways in which the British uh, supported Michael Collins through that war and the pressure they put on Michael Collins. That will be very interesting. So I suppose when I make the programme about the Civil War, I'll have the um, Spanish Civil War on my mind. Uh, it's true, of course, that I was born a Catholic. So uh, you know that's relatively unusual. Uh, for a member of the British establishment, so you know that might also slightly play on my mind. Um, but no, I don't. I don't think probably more broadly than that. The Spanish Civil War was more or less my way into television, so that's another way of considering this. Because the very first program I made after the British people had given me my sabbatical in 1997 uh, from Parliament uh, was uh, a program about my father in the Spanish Civil War. So it's what got me into making television programs. So there's a, a connection there. Without that, I wouldn't be making TV programs today, I don't suppose. Quite a number of um, a very complimentary uh, comments here, just observations that you may not be a historian, yet in modern times you've probably done more than anyone since Robert Key to raise the profile of Irish history in the UK. Um, that was followed by a question about your advice regarding what advice you might give to Simon Coveney regarding interaction with the British government. But I think in some ways that was also uh, you answered that in response to, to Michael Kennedy's question there. Uh, again, another one I think drawing on both your reading of the period and your own experience after studying the Anglo-Irish negotiations and your argument that many in the British elite were ignorant or indifferent to Irish affairs. Do you have any regrets from your own political career regarding the Irish problem? Do you think yourself or your colleagues likewise failed fully to understand Ireland? In answer to that last question, absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. And, uh, and not just us, but that's not a way of uh, deflecting blame. No, when I, when I reflect upon it, I, I think that's very true. <clears throat> In the last programme that um, I made for RTE, I, uh, I met Jerry Adams, and there's a, a moment of conversation <clears throat> where he says to me, if you knew everything that you knew now, if you had known when you were in the government everything that you know now, would your attitude have been the same? To which my reply is, I think you make a good point, probably not, but you should remember that I entered Parliament because my predecessor had been blown up in the IRA bombing of the Brighton Hotel, and that had a big influence on my thinking. So it's quite, a, quite an interesting television moment, that. Can I just say, in passing, the, the, one of the early things you read was a, was a complimentary piece saying that we'd raise the level of understanding in Britain of, of Irish history. Unfortunately, that is not true. The programmes were made by RTE. We got a little bit of funding from BBC Northern Ireland and the programmes were shown, I think most of them anyway, in Northern Ireland. But as far as I know, they've not been shown in Great Britain. They might just, they might just be available on the BBC iPlayer because they sneaked onto BBC Northern Ireland. But I offer that as an example of the continuing ignorance. Um, you know, as someone who you know, makes quite a lot of programmes for British television, makes a programme about Irish history, 
and it is not taken up by the BBC. There's a few questions here which are more, more specific then to what happened in Ireland afterwards. Uh, one of our listeners, our audience, asking whether it's accurate to say that partition foregrounded and marked out two sectarian states. But for the northern state, the intent was a legislative sectarianism, while in the south, it was an osmotic sectarianism between the church and the government. So I suppose what we're uh, being asked there is, uh, do we sort of have the... Um, might the Irish situation have been less sectarian without partition and the creation of those two? I'd, I'd, like, you, I'd like you to remind us, is not, is not the Northern Ireland Parliament established with proportional representation? And is not that proportional representation abolished somewhere along the way? We were talking earlier about good faith or lack of good faith. The change from proportional representation in Northern Ireland to first past the post voting is a clear, uh, a clear change, and I would suggest a clear breach of good faith. Yeah, I think that's that is part of the legislation for the uh, notional parliaments of Northern and Southern Ireland contained in the Government of Ireland Act. Though again, of course, that there are, it's a good point you raise, and there is a tendency, I think, possibly with hindsight, or to look at that change as coming from sectarian motives, where any understanding of internal unionist politics would argue that it has more to do with James Craig's desire to keep unionism united and to head off the threat from labour unionism. So again, it's, it's a much more complex. I think it's, I see the point our, our uh, audience member is uh, getting at here, but I think it's, again, it's, it's maybe identifying one aspect, whereas there are much wider dynamics at play in the two Irish states. But it's one of those great, uh, what ifs uh, without partition might you have in the, in the south of Ireland might you have had less influence possibly of the Catholic Church in Irish life uh, that's uh, maybe a what if for another discussion um, Church Chamberlain returning the treaty ports in 1938 wondering why he did it again from a defence perspective I think we, we probably have touched on that with response with the the reta retention of the port in Northern Ireland probably made the others obsolete and I suppose they had 17 years experience of not very much happening in the three Irish ones um, I, I I don't know I haven't studied that period uh, I mean Churchill thought there was no good reason for giving them up whatsoever and he thought it was an extremely dangerous thing to do that was his view in uh, 1938. But I, but I haven't studied the period. I mean, it is, it is quite striking that a British Prime Minister does that in the year of Munich. I mean, it's not as though the, you know, the prospect of war with Germany was distant. It was, uh, it was imminent. I'm just uh, reading through some of the questions here. Um, does the available documentation indicate that each and every, each and every one that voted in the Dáil 64 to 57 for and against the treaty had examined in their entirety all the articles of agreement and the terms in the annex, and were the complexities of these and their long-term implications fully understood? I think one uh, set of documents we have, and it's publicly available for that, are the Dáil Treaty Debates. They're, they were actually a, 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 the bound volumes of Dáil Treaty Debates. There is a specific one for the, uh, the treaty debate itself, and I think any... Uh, his work, uh, if you've had time on your hands ploughing through them, I think any serious uh, study of that will show that it certainly th th there was a good understanding of the main headlines, at least, of the um, of the, the treaty. Can you remind us how long the debate was? It was, quite, it was quite a long started, debate, Yeah, it, it started in December. <coughs> I can't remember the exact number of days. It started in December mid-December 1922 and ended, of course, in January with and a break for Christmas. And that break is often considered quite important because a lot of the TDs would have gone back to their own constituencies where they potentially were influenced or at least lobbied by important figures in uh, in Irish life, and particularly the Catholic Church. Catholic Church leaders were rode in behind the treaty, and there is a sense that possibly that break for Christmas, given how short, how small the 
margin of error is. Four people voting the other way. Robert mm. Barton changing his mind earlier than he eventually did might have changed things. So possibly that the negotiation, the, the treaty debate breaking up for Christmas was uh, was important. We have an interesting one here now from uh, someone who's from the Collins family. Michael Collins was a cousin of my grandfather. My family's perspective has been that Michael Collins viewed the treaty as being seriously imperfect but nevertheless an important step on the journey to Ireland becoming a republic with, he thought, an end to the bloodshed. So I suppose what you're, you're looking at there is the treaty, it was a compromise. It, the treaty was a compromise from both sides. So in negotiations, people are always going to have to give up something of what they want. But would you yes, I mean, the, that's well, the, the, the tone of a couple of questions this evening was, you know, couldn't there have been a compromise between the British and the Irish positions? But I suppose that, you know, from the British point of view, I'd have to say, wait a minute, this was a compromise. Uh, <laughs> this begins by being part of the United Kingdom. Uh, and it moves from that to being home rule, and then it moves from that to dominion status. Uh, so, you know, from the British point of view, you would say, well, of course it was a compromise. And the fact that the Irish didn't get everything they wanted of course, that was a compromise too. But um, this member of the Collins family is absolutely right. Collins thought that this was the way to Irish freedom. And, by the way, he was absolutely right. He just didn't, of course, live to see it. I have another wonderful question here for you. I, at times in the discussion, I asked you to uh, place yourself back in the, the, the role that you had previously held of, of Secretary of State for Defence, but we have one here from, from Declan McKeown uh, asking you, if you had been Prime Minister in 1921, <laughs> would you have negotiated the same treaty? <laughs> I think the answer has to be yes, uh, because, uh, well, because I think it had become... A necessity, but m more importantly, it had become doable that there, there was a deal to be done. Uh, and uh, obviously, I would have felt exactly the same pressures as the people of the time felt. Uh, I would just have, you know, lacked the skill that, uh, that Lloyd George had, I think. Uh, I, I was just wondering whether we should recall this. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to remind people. Here we are. Uh, Churchill viewed the agreement as a great and peculiar manifestation of British genius. We've had that quote before. But he recognised that Collins was terribly shaken by the terms that he had finally accepted. Michael Collins rose looking as if he was going to shoot someone, preferably in my... Pref sorry. Michael Collins rose looking as if he was going to shoot someone, preferably himself. In all my life, this is Churchill, I think, in all my life, I've never seen so much passion and suffering in restraint. And I think there's another point, isn't there, where Collins, he's talking to one of the British delegation, and one of the British delegation says, you know, if I, if I, if I made that agreement with you, it would cost me my political life. And Collins says, when I make this agreement with you, it will cost you my actual life. Which it did which, in the which end. Which it did. Um, <clears throat> Looking at again, we have a few interesting questions about um, the looking at it from the British perspective and asking, did the Irish understand what exactly what they were asking the British to do? Did, they, did the Irish delegation understand the risks that the British potentially were taking? But also, what was the outcome of the negotiations for the British government? Was this uh, it, the exact wording here was had they boosted or lessened the confidence of the British government. I interpret that to mean would the British government have seen it as a success for them the, uh, negotiating the, the treaty settlement. So the first one there I suppose is did the Irish delegation, do we have any sense that they understood the potential risks the British delegation were taking and secondly how did the treaty reflect on the British government uh, success or failure for them? Well, I, I have to remind you that <coughs> the television programmes I made were all on the basis of British documents. So I don't, I simply don't know the Irish documents. Um, I thought it was interesting, that Churchill quote, we only have Churchill's word for it, but you remember that he says of Collins's attitude to the treaty ports, 
the Irish delegates made no difficulty about this. They saw that it was vital to our safety that we should be able to use these ports, and therefore the matter passed into the structure of the treaty without any serious controversy. That implies that the Irish um, delegation, at least in that instance, did have a very good understanding of, um, of the risks that Britain was prepared to take and the risks that it was not. And to the extent that I've um, seen Collins's words at the negotiations quoted, he seemed to me to have an admirable command of the detail, including an understanding of his position and of the British position. So that is my, that is my feeling, that the way Collins expressed himself, he seemed to, he seemed to have a lot of information and sensitivity. An interesting question here. One of, one of our uh, viewers tonight teaches Irish history at A-level uh, in, in England and wonders, is it fair to characterise British policy during the War of Independence as nothing else but insincere and limited? So would it be fair to be that critical of British policy in Ireland? Insincere and limited, limited. is that right? Well, limited, yes, of course. Uh, I think we've mentioned that a number of times. The British mind is somewhere else completely. By the way, I mean, we mentioned Britain's foreign policy concerns, but Britain was very concerned about strikes at home, uh, about militancy. It, uh, it, it was quite worried about the possibility of communism. Uh, so there was, you know, there was disruption at home, and all of that was on its mind as well. Um, insincerity, you see, I think indifference is what there really was, ignorance and indifference. And I think ignorance and indifference are a more severe charge than insincerity. Yeah, and I think uh, when the, the question here relates to British government, and obviously we answered that mostly in relation to the, uh, the actual government. But if you look wide, wider British governing structures, it seems to me that one person I think who is genuinely sincere about Ireland in this period is the king about whom yes. we spoke. And I think in, in the one of the previous projects we worked together in the Hawks and Doves, we explored the importance of the king's speech in opening that parliament. So I think there's the idea of collectively, but you can identify individuals within the British establishment and I think whether I think that the king had a fondness for Ireland I'm not sure the Irish reciprocated the fondness to the same extent but I think if we were to single out someone within the British establishment who was genuinely sincere about bringing the events of the war of independence in Ireland to a halt it was the king yes I mean one 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 other thing we didn't mention was um, hatred uh, I, I began I began the war in doves by quoting a British general. Now, I'm not, I, I can't at this point remember who it was, but he's, 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 I don't think it's French. Uh, I think it's one of the army commanders in Ireland. And when he's sent over, he says in his diary, I think, I hate the Irish more than I hate the Bosch. And this is a man who's just spent four years killing the Bosch. Uh, and he says happily, as he's dispatched to Ireland, I hate the Irish more than the Bosch. Now... Again, you know, I think that's a more important charge than insincerity. Uh, we had a number of, of uh, questions there coming in, which I think shows how uh, engaging the whole uh, discussion was. Before I get to thanks and things, I just want to check, are there any final observations or questions from our in-person, in-house audience? I, yes, I think there's, um, there was one there. Uh. First, I'd like to say I really enjoyed the talk. I thought it was interesting uh, uh, with both Dr. Coleman and Michael talking about how Collins thought he was the wrong person for the job and about De Valera not coming. One thing I always found quite interesting about the treaty delegation was the presence of Arthur Griffith because in some level he's an obvious choice found to Sinn Féin. But if we want to go for a maximalist position from the Irish perspective, seems kind of counterintuitive to have someone who advocated dual monarchy in a previous political life in 1905. So were there choices in the delegation that could have gone better? Like, I also note that, say, there was no one in the treaty delegation from what became Northern Ireland as well. So maybe it ties into what Michael was saying about the Irish not really having an idea about what they wanted to come forth from the 
uh, negotiations. And I think it also ties into Michael's point about the Irish delegation being divided. And I think one thing Lloyd George recognised early on was that Griffith, and even possibly to his surprise, Collins, were more on the moderate wing. And we see that the way he, he hives off the, the delegation and deals with... Uh, tends to hive off Collins and Griffith from the rest of the delegation and then even brings a lot of pressure on Griffith not to break off the negotiations on the issue of Ulster, which really clears the way then the Irish have kind of conceded one of their trump cards in terms of tactics in that regard. So I think that yeah. uh, observation really picks up on that, that important point you uh, highlighted there of divisions within the Irish delegation. Yes, again, I'm not privy to the Irish documents, so I can't comment, but I entirely agree with you. The decision that they're going to have, I think it's just four people in the room for many of the important discussions, so not the delegations and not the secretariats, um, is obviously very important in helping to bring about an agreement. Again, I mean, it looks like the British deployed a tactic that was quite successful, but I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, it suited Griffith and Collins as well to be alone in the room because they, well, I think they did want to do a deal. They, they, they had turned up and they turned up because they wanted to do a deal and they didn't particularly want people there stopping them. And, oh, Marie, I mean, a very obvious point. After Lloyd George offers this threat that there will be terrible, unremitting war or whatever he says, the delegation goes back and debates it and votes and comes back with their decision that they'll accept the treaty, they do not pick up the telephone to Dublin, which I think was technically possible at the time. They could, you could telephone Dublin. They do not do so. Any, any thoughts on that? I don't know, and I think uh, there's also stories about De Valera being uh, in Limerick and being hard to communicate with. So maybe he was, um, maybe he was hiding from being con uh, being communicated with. I think uh, Michael had just one more uh, point. I think he wanted to get in there before I move to the uh, final stages of time. If I may, him. just a very quick point to the, the questioner there. Um, Griffith was the natural choice. He was the Minister for Foreign Affairs. So you send your Minister for Foreign Affairs, your Minister for Finance. But not your President. Not your President. That's a whole other, we don't have time for that. then, of course, that. the king wasn't there, and he was the head yeah, of state yeah. as well. But I think that's the important point on Griffith, that he is the Minister for Foreign Affairs. He's the obvious person to send from mm -hmm. that perspective. And th thanks, Michael. And, of course, as the Director of Documents and Irish Foreign Policy, you'll be well, well familiar with Griffith's, role, Griffith's yeah, activities do, in that role. The Irish role. documents are just outside yes. of the, the shelf there, Michael. I'm in charge of the, the project that's publishing my colleague, uh, John Gibney here. Excellent. An another, another excellent... Um, do, do you mind if I talk about a document yeah. that none of you yes. knows about? Um, I, I very recently discovered that uh, the house I live in, in London, um, was... So, so the year after all this happens, at last the Conservatives get rid of David Lloyd George. And he doesn't see this coming, and he's booted out of 10 Downing Street, and he doesn't have anywhere to go. And I've just discovered that he went to the house that I presently live in. And this house was owned by Edward... Grigg, who was his private secretary. And Edward Grigg said, well, I've got a house. Uh, Mr. Lloyd George, who wasn't prime minister by then, you can go and live in this house. So I found that out recently. I thought it was very interesting uh, that Lloyd George had gone to live in my house. Just last week, we discovered uh, the programme of a concert that was given in the house by kind permission of Mr. Edward Grigg on the 4th of December, 1921. Now, Grigg was the Prime Minister's private secretary, was one of the Sherpas during these treaty negotiations. I was very struck by the idea that he'd come, you know, hot foot from negotiating with Collins to allow a concert to be given in the house. So there's a document you don't know about. It is the programme of music in 86 Vincent Square on the 4th of December, 1921. Well, I think on that note, um, I, I'm going to conclude by thanking everyone this evening, uh, mostly to yourself, Michael, for a very engaging discussion, which I think really uh, brought out the strengths of your uh, interest in Irish history through your series of documentaries. And we very much look forward to seeing the uh, one which is in, in progress, we hope, on the Civil War, but also bringing that uh, very unique um, 
observation that only someone who has been at the heart of politics can reflect on history. Uh, to, uh, there's a number of other people who have uh, been really central to this event going ahead tonight. So I want to thank the teams in both the National Archives of Ireland and the Royal Irish Academy. So to Orla, Karen and Elizabeth in the archives, to Hugh Shields and everyone here in uh, Dawson Street. Um, to the Imagine Technolo Technology team, to Orla McCabe and Shelley Parkinson who have provided the sign language interpretation for the evening. And if, you've, uh, if tonight's event has whetted your appetite for more, I just want to mention again what, what Orla said at the outset that the next event in this series on the Irish Revolution and the making of the New World Order will be held, I, I think it's the 23rd of November and booking for that opens next week week and also from the 6th of December until early March 2022 the exhibition on the treaty which John Gibney and Michael and uh, others have been involved in and which has just uh, been on display in London for the last few weeks which contains some amazing records from the archives including the, the smallest uh, receipts for expenses by the delegation which uh, I heard John speak recently about on the BBC's um, Year 21 podcast. That exhibition will open in the Coach House in Dublin Castle on the 6th of December and run until March 2022. So I hope that people, if, they, if you're based in Ireland, you get an opportunity to go and visit that exhibition. And no one has yet thanked you, Marie, so may I thank you. Uh, you've, done, um, you've, you've, done, you've done spectacular work this evening. Uh, you, you've put so much effort into preparing this evening. Your knowledge on these subjects is uh, incomparable. And, uh, and you've held uh, the hand of this amateur all evening. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.